Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that's good. It's like uh, I know your discussion with Josh Rasmus and you guys were talking about how, um, you know, we need some sort of relevant difference between these in order to break that symmetry. I mean, that's what I mean, if you really think about it, many philosophical debates are just trying to find relevant differences between two things. Um, so it's really interesting to see connections with that in other areas. But uh, I'm wondering, I mean, maybe Craig would just have to say, like, if he's trying to find that ontological difference. Maybe he's going to have to give up on on like the the sort of Hilbert's hotel and the mere existence of an actual infinite because now we're sort of mm -hmm. switching to it's being completed right we're switching to um, it's being have been you know it's the the will have been that perfect tense the future perfect tense so I'm guessing he's going to have to say like okay fine it's not just an actual infinite that's the problem I guess it's some sort of you know a traversal and then a completion but now he's sort of conceded that that philosophical argument doesn't work and he's going to have to go to that other philosophical argument from traversing an actual infinite or something along those lines uh, well okay so I mean that's a separate argument, and it's not one that we explicitly address in the paper we're talking about, but it is one that we're thinking about at the moment. And um, I mean, OK, so when it comes so this is a bit more unsettled um, of what my view is. Right. But the Craig's idea here is in the traversing the actual infinite idea. Um, um, so the idea is it, it, it's not possible to traverse an actual infinite. Um, and you'd have to traverse the whole of it in order to arrive at now, right? Um, and now is happening, right? Um, and if it wasn't possible to get here without traversing an actual infinite and traversing an actual infinite is possible, then there's your reductio, right? Couldn't be that there is an actual infinite uh, that needed to be traversed. That's basically the argument. Um, but you might say, well, why can't you traverse an actual infinite, right? Like, what's what's the deal with that? Why is that impossible? And basically, Craig's argument is that you can't count to infinity, right? And so, so if I and and then you know, so they go, okay, well, imagine somebody who starts counting now, right? Let's call him George, and George starts counting one, two, three, blah, 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 and let's just stipulate that George never stops counting. Um, and the question is, well. Uh, will George count to infinity? Um, and Craig thinks that the answer has to be no, right? And that the reason is because, well, uh, the, 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 the way he puts it in his book and in the um, Companion to Natural Theology, because he has this like 100 page paper in the Companion to Natural Theology on the Kalam, um, and the way he puts it in those two places is that Aleph naught, right? Aleph zero is the kind of name or whatever for the smallest uh, infinite number, right? It's the, the number that's greater than any finite number. Um, the first number that's greater than any finite number. And as Craig points out, I mean, kind of correctly in a way, um, it, that that number is not the successor of any number, right? There's no finite right. number n which comes before it. Sorry, I didn't hear that, Joe. Yeah, categorically different. Like, it's not it's not like a successor of it. You, it's almost in another category, as it were. Yeah, right, right. It's not in the, um, it's not in the, it's not a natural number, right? It's a different type of number, that's right. So there's no number that comes before Aleph naught, right? It just is the one that comes after all of the natural numbers collectively. And Craig's like saying, well, when you're counting, what you're doing is you're announcing the next number, the one that comes after the one you've just said, right? And if that's all you're doing, then you're never going to say Aleph naught because that doesn't come after any number and it doesn't come immediately after any number. So how are you going to get there? And you might say, well, okay, I guess that proves that you can't count to infinity. Um, and it kind of does, but then it kind of doesn't in the same way. Well, so Dret uh, Fred Dretzky has his paper in 65 called Counting to Infinity, and he says you can count to infinity. And his argument is basically, say George just counts forever and he doesn't stop. Well, let's just say George starts counting and he doesn't stop. Um, then it's true that George counts every number n, right? For every number n, it's true that George will count that number, right? Um, but that just means that all of the natural numbers are such that each one of them is going to be counted by George at some point or another. And then if you ask, well, how many natural numbers is it that George is going to count? And the cardinality of that set is Aleph naught, right? That's how many numbers he'll count. And right? the cardinality of all of the finite numbers is Aleph naught. Right? It's not a finite number. It's, an, it's the first infinite number. Right? In fact, that's the definition of Aleph naught. So in Dretzky's sense, George will count to infinity because George will 
complete infinite an infinite number of count individual counting events eventually but there won't ever be a point at which he says any number that's not a finite number right so he never says aleph nor it's just that the cardinality of the events of him announcing numbers is equal to aleph nor <laughs> and so it just means that there's actually two senses of counting to infinity one of them is you know, you've said all of the natural numbers and now you've, on, you've moved on to another number, right? And Craig's saying that's not going to happen. But Dretzky's just saying, well, if all you do is count natural numbers, then what you do is is count an infinite number of numbers, right? So they're just two different things. And then the question is just, well, which one of them is relevant to the infinite past? Now, let's imagine that um, there's an infinite number of events in the past, and let's assign a number to each one of them, right? a unique number to each one of them. Um, I don't have to assign Aleph naught to any of them, right? There's just one event for each number. How many number? How many events are there? Aleph naught many numbers, right? That, that's how many there are. But there isn't one that's, that's, that has the number Aleph naught assigned to it. Well, think about Hilbert's Hotel, right? How many rooms are there in Hilbert's Hotel? There's Aleph naught many rooms, right? But there's no room number such that it's got Aleph naught on the outside, right? Each room number has a finite number on the outside, right? There's no infinity of the room. There's just each number is a finite number. So if Hilbert's hotel is an infinite hotel, then it doesn't need that extra one on the end, right? It's already infinite. Um, and if that's enough, then it's not clear exactly why, even if you can't do what Craig says you can't do, that that means that you can't count to infinity. It just seems like you kind of can, right? It's just you need to be clear about um, whether we're talking about an ordinal number or a cardinal number. In terms of the cardinality of your counting, you do kind of count an infinite number. In terms of the ordinal numbers that you actually name, then you don't, right? You just name finite numbers. So it's this kind of classic ordinal cardinal distinction that we need to bring in. But once we've got that in place, it's like relatively straightforward, it seems to me. And you kind of just can <laughs> traverse an actual infinite, right? I mean, another way of looking at it is like, there's no, there's no, uh, let's say I can traverse in principle any finite duration of time, right? Well, there's no time that's so far away that the, the, the like interval between that and now is more than an, a finite time. So in principle, I can traverse all of the intervals I need to, right? Like, where's the, show me the, the, interval I can't traverse um, and you can't do that because all of them are finite it's just only taken collectively that there's um, an, an aleph not many uh, points that you need to cross so anyway it's 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 a subtle I mean it's a subtle thing it requires a little bit of um, understanding of um, infinite mathematics right transfinite mathematics but it seems to me that when you do that um, and you're careful enough to spell it out properly that um, certainly the force of the argument is sucked away i'm not saying that it's like completely has its ass kicked but like it's not quite so clear now that like to begin with you're like yeah sure i'm not going to say that number right that definitely won't count that but then when you realize do i even need to say it i'm not sure i need to say it like i mean then it just like everything's up in the air and it's not clear really if that's a devastating argument at all it might be that it's just sort of posed on a um and a confusion about ordinality and cardinality and i mean i don't think that's right i mean craig's not stupid and he's not unaware of these things and actually his books are really cool introduction to um to cantorian uh concepts and stuff i mean i recommend it it's a really good read um but yeah i just i just i don't really like the argument it doesn't seem to me a great argument i don't know i i'm waffling it's just something i've been thinking about at the moment you see so if you get me start to talking about that then uh yeah <laughs> carried away yeah, no, it's good. Look forward to seeing what you guys come up with on that. Joe, did you have any more? I mean, that was kind of your question. You any more clarification or other points along those lines? Mm. Yeah, I'm wondering if like, I'm wondering if that intuition almost rests, as it were, on um, starting at a definite point and then successively going from that point and so on. But, you know, if there's a, a beginningless past, we're not starting at a given point and then, you know, mm -hmm from that one point an infinite now granted like we do have this one point and then extending backwards but I'm wondering if the absurdity or you know the intuitive incoherence of it uh, if there is any I'm wondering if that applies to the past you know because it's not as though we're starting at some point in the past 
And then, yeah. you know, we're like counting forward and um, completing an infinite that way. Um, I mean, I guess someone could like count down, you know, uh, and somehow and then arrive at zero or one today. But I'm wondering if the intuition yeah. carries it. Well, I think in that case, so if you take somebody who's counting down, right, then the thing that Craig was pointing to before, which was that you have to somehow state a number which isn't the successor of any other number. Like when you're counting down, like explain to me at what point I need to do that. Right. Like I you, so you described this idea of like someone you come across him and he's like going three, two, one, few, I finished or whatever. At what point does he have to say Aleph Nort? Like, I mean, when did that happen? That doesn't have to happen at any point. So the, if if you think it's different, if you think that there's something problematic about having to state the number that's not a successor of any number, that just doesn't feature in that story, right? So that can't be what's problematic about it. So generally, what's ha what's problematic about that is supposed to be, look, the, I mean, this is, this is just a different argument to the traversing the actual influence and just flagging that. What's supposed to be problematic about that is it's just, well, look, why didn't he finish yesterday or like tomorrow or whatever? Like, what what explains the guy finishing now? Because if he's had an infinite amount of time. To get here, you should have had enough time already to finish yesterday or something, right? Mm -hmm. So then it's supposed to be like a kind of challenge to the principle of sufficient reason. Um, and it seems to me that the thing to say about that is, I mean, a very, very strong principle of the sufficient of sufficient reason, which is that like everything has a sufficient reason, is problematic on its own anyway. And most theists these days don't endorse the really strong version of it, right? Because what they're going to say is something along the lines of. You know, because if you say, well, why did God make this contingent universe instead of that one? Like, why didn't he make a universe where like this atom was just very slightly to the left of where it happens to be right now? Like, why? How come? Right. Because surely that can't be justifying a moral principle that like makes him have to do it this way rather than that way. And I'll say, yeah, sure. OK, so like that what happened there is that God makes like a free choice. And like if you push exactly why that free choice was made rather than a different free choice, then there's no like necessitating uh, sufficient reason that you can give for that, right? So there's no um, contrastive reason, right? It's reason that explains why he did A rather than B, right? What there is is some non-contrastive reason, right? Some something that played into the uh, circumstances, right? There's an some kind of adequate but less than sufficient reason or explanation of what happened there. And okay, if that's the game we're playing, then it's it's not unreasonable to apply the same thing to why the guy's counting down and finishing now rather than yesterday. I mean, am I supposed to provide a necessitating sufficient reason for that? Or can I provide a non-contrastive, non-necessitating, non-sufficient reason as well? And it seems if I can, it seems like the door is open for that type of move there. So I can just say something like, well, he chose to, right? It was just his intention to finish today. I, mean, I don't know. Is that not possible? I don't know why that's not possible. Or to cook something else up, right? Like a, you know, he has a kind of tendency to do that, and that's just like the way he is, or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, it just feels like if you can come up with like, well, God just chose to do this, then I can say something like that about what's happening here. So I mean, I'm not saying it's like a completely watertight way of going about this, but what I'm just drawing attention to is that there's like similarities in the way that you know what's supposed to be problematic about that counting down example isn't what Craig was saying about having to say uh, Aleph naught at some point, because that doesn't happen in that scenario. And if it's something about like being required by a strong principle of sufficient reason to explain why it was this moment and not some other moment, then I mean, that demand is too strong, right? Because theists wouldn't be able to live up to that demand themselves in other contexts, like why did God make this rather than that? And then apply the context, uh, apply the standard that they use there, and it seems like it's not impossible to dream up some explanation that would give you a non-contrastive reason because they're they're ten a penny, it seems to me. So yeah. it feels to me like that argument's like substantially uh, weaker than even than the one we were dealing with in the paper. I think <laughs> that's the weak one. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah, it's a good way to go. About it. I, I wonder if the piece could they could level some sort of principle along the lines of it's a, just a defeasible principle that you know all else being equal we should prefer to minimize uh, brute contrastive facts right and so mm -hmm. if they do that well then um they could say like okay suppose it's possible then someone could count down in such a manner and that would sort of multiply brute contrastive facts and hence all else being equal we at least have the feasible evidence against uh, an infinite path. So I wonder what you think of that. 
I mean, I think when we're talking about evidence and that type of rule of thumb thing, then I think that there's something out of, um, I think that there's something inappropriate about that here. I mean, what counts as evidence that he's um, really counting down from in, from infinity? I mean, unless I've been watching him the whole time, I don't. Um, it's not clear that that makes that it's a good way of approaching this to think about it in terms of like evidence and defeasible rules and stuff. I mean, I have to just assume like an a priori uh, thought experiment that that is what he's doing. And now I'm in that world. I'm not sure um, defeasible rules is the right way to go. It feels like what we're doing is some uh, a priori principle way of reasoning here. And I mean, so if so, and the way that the rubber meets the road here is that like, well, I mean, if that just is what's happened, right? Like if that's the premise of the thought experiment, then I mean, it, he has done, okay? So it has to be explained in some way. And the minimum, you know, you can't just say, well, I, I, my preference is that, that, that weird things like that don't happen very much because I have a rule of thumb, which tries to minimize that type of explanation I'd be forced to give there. Because, I mean, if it has happened, the minimum amount of explanation you'd need would be one that at least explains that, right? And if that happens twice, because some other guy finishes counting down tomorrow, I'm going to need to explain that too, right? That's the minimum I'm going to, a minimum required in that world, right? Because there's at least two events that are weird like that that need explanation. And the principle has to just be explaining um, as, men, as, few thing, as few things as you can, whilst explaining as much as you can. Explain, sorry, explain using, resorting to non-contrastive explanations as few times as you can, whilst accounting for all of the things that need accounting for in the world that you're in. And if we're just saying by stipulation that you're in a world where somebody actually does count down from infinity to, to zero, then the minimum that you can get away with is that. Like, like if God actually did make a free choice to create the world, then you're going to need to to take that um, tool off the shelf anyway and, and apply it to that situation. Everything else being equal, I'd rather not take that thing off the shelf to have to use it here. But you know what I do because God made a choice and I need to find some kind of explanation for it, right? So if um, there's an infinite barrage of people all counting down from infinity and all finishing at different times all, all over the place, damn it, it's going to be a really confusing world and I'm going to have to keep reaching for non-contrastive explanations in order to like say stuff about what's going on. We don't live in that world, I'm pretty sure. Um, it would be difficult to know even if we did or if it just looked like we did. Um, but, you know, that that seems to me the actual empirical question of like what I would say if I was like face to face with that doesn't really seem relevant. The question is just like the a priori one has to be explain <laughs> the stuff that uh, in principle is... Uh, put into play by the thought experiment that you happen to be playing about with. Um, so yeah, that, that's how I would come back to that. It's just, you would need to, you'd need to say something about that if that's what actually happened.